Hey everyone, welcome back to Onyx Pages. So this is technically my vlog for day one, um, but I don't know that I actually vlogged anything, so it might just be a book review. I finished uh, The Salt Roads by Nalo Hopkinson, and I am going to do my, oh, there's Tomi's arm. We can see your arm. Do you mind? Do you mind if we see your arm? Do you mind if we... <laughs> okay. I can't see it though. Where is it? It's right there. It's there. Trust me. Is it there? Yeah. And is it other part of my anatomy? No other part of your anatomy can be seen. Oh, do you want to say hi to the people? Hi, people. Okay. So, um... As Tommy knows, I finished The Salt Roads by Nalo Hopkinson, and I am so happy to have read this book. This book was published in 2000, I want to say 2003, 4, 2003, copyright 2003. Um, and in this book, we follow five characters. Uh, they are, four of the characters are women, and four the fifth character is an uh, otherworldly being. These four characters live in different parts of the world during different time periods. And all of them are women who are struggling with um, oppression, various forms of oppression. So one woman is Mare and she lives um, she lives on a plantation in Saint-Domingue, which is the name that of Haiti when it was under French colonization. Um, so she lives there with her uh, husband and her lover, and uh, she lives in a community of enslaved Africans on a sugarcane plantation. Um, she is a doctoress, meaning that she is, uh, in addition to doing her regular um, duties meaning like I'm calling them duties like it's a job but she was enslaved so in addition to cutting cane and weeding um, the cane fields she also is uh, responsible for tending to the sick um, she is struggling um, because number one she understands that she has a calling that she has a relationship with the God of the sea, um, uh, who she calls Izili, uh, but she doesn't know what this god wants her to do. She also is struggling because there are people uh, on the plantation who want to rebel and she's afraid of what the violence of rebellion will bring and she's not sure that it'll be successful. Although, she is well aware, as are many of the enslaved Africans who live on the plantations are aware, that the Maroons are up in the bushes and they have a compound of free African peoples where they could go to, but the Maroons aren't necessarily people that she thinks are trustworthy. Um, so there's a lot of tension uh, there's a lot of tension on this plantation. Obviously, it's a plantation, um, but there are rumblings of rebellion and she's not sure where she fits in. So throughout the story, she has a number of different um, events happen to her that are mystical and political and romantic, and we follow that storyline. The next storyline that we follow is a storyline of Jean. Um, and Jeanne, Jean, I can't pronounce her name properly, but it is J-E-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, Jeanne. Uh, she is an entertainer. She lives in Paris. It is the mid 19th century there. Um, and she is the mistress of Charles Baudelaire, who's a famous French poet. And she is, as a black woman living in France at the time, her only options for, like her only retirement plan and her only options for, um, for living well is to have um, a lover 
who she obviously can't marry, but somebody who will take care of her and her mother. Her mother and her grandmother were all um, entertainers or in the sex trade, and she doesn't want that life for herself. Although she can do it if she needs to make money, that's totally fine, but she would prefer to live um, a more comfortable life. So we follow her as she um, struggles with her relationship with Charles, uh, as she tries to make a way for her and her mom, and as she deals with these strange sort of blackouts that she's having that make very little sense to her, but are happening. We then follow, um, what is the third person's name? Uh, Thais, or Thais. And Thais works in a brothel in Alexandria. Um, and she is uh, young, she is enslaved, she is required to engage in sexual acts. Um, and her family sold her into slavery. So she lives in this, um, this brothel along with a number of other girls and they are, you know, they provide sexual services for uh, sailors and business people who come to town. Um, and she decides that she's gonna run away with her friend Judah and they run away to Rome. Um, and so when they do that, she has her own sort of journey that she goes on uh, with him as she discovers things about herself. Um, and so these these three, I said that there were four women, but there were actually just three three women. So we follow these three women. Every chapter is, uh, uh, you know, advances the story of one of those three men, women's lives. But then there's a fourth character, and this character is really unnamed for most of the story. And this character is, we know that it's not human, but we don't exactly know what this character is. And so every so often there's a chapter written from the perspective of that character as that character discovers itself. And that is one of the most beautiful and pleasing parts of this story. We get to see these three women's lives because this character has a relationship with each of these women and it is the binding force that brings these three stories together of these three different women who are each struggling with oppression and patriarchy and um, various different type types of enslavement this character um, tries to help tries to figure out what its role is and it is absolutely mesmerizing. So really, the Salt Roads, um, and it's, it would be a spoiler to sort of get into what the Salt Roads are necessarily, but I will say that salt water and all the different ways that salt water appears in our bodies on the planet um, really uh, features significantly in this story. So I'm gonna go into the um, seven Carrie Shell category. So the first one is world building. How does this world enhance ours? So I will say that I've read a lot of stories uh, that are science fiction or um, speculative fiction or fantasy stories that take place on plantations or that are written from the perspective of enslaved Africans. There are a number of them that I've read at this point and I quite enjoy reading them. Um, this one contributes a number of things to that canon. Number one, um, there is sexual diversity and, uh, and also relationship diversity on the plantation. So the main, the main character that we follow on the, in the plantation mare, um, she's in a polyamorous relationship, and I think that's one of the it's one of the few times that I've seen that in um, in a story. So that was different, and I think that was a contribution. Um, also, in this in this story, it contributes another kind of thread to the slave plantation trope. So it, obviously, in the Caribbean, uh, unlike uh, on uh, plantations in the U.S. 
um, there was there are African like African descended indigenous people. Mm. I won't necessarily, maybe not African descended uh, indigenous people, but different groups of indigenous people. Um, and also different groups of, of black people coexisting, African people coexisting with Africans who were enslaved. So getting a little bit about the Maroons was interesting for me, although we don't learn a lot about the Maroons. So that was pretty cool. Um, I think that the world building was pretty solid in two of the stories. The third story, the one of Thais, um, I we don't really get introduced to that character until the last third of the book or mid or maybe halfway. And it felt to me like I didn't get enough of that character. I couldn't follow her arc as much. And so the while the world building was quite interesting, it felt very different from the world building as it related to the other three characters. But I would say I would still give this a um, a full carry shell for world building. The second one uh, carry shell is about characters. And the question is, how do the characters add value to science fiction and fantasy canon? Um, the characters are pretty strong, I would say, all except for that last character who we don't get to learn enough about. And I think that has to, has to do mostly with the pacing of the story. Um, but you, you know, it really is a meditation on the different ways that women, that, that African women um, contend with oppression and how they, how they, how we, have been able to survive, how we've been able to create community and to create strong relationships in the context of oppression and the ways that we have appealed to um, otherworldly beings in order to make sense of or to find a place in our own experiences to survive. Um, with the exception of the last character that I don't think was developed enough, I think we got a lot of that. And we also got that from this this otherworldly character that we follow. Uh, so I would I would give a half a carry shell for characters because of that last character that we don't get to learn enough about. The third is point of view. How did the main point of view or points of view impact the telling of the story? So here you'll recall that Walida e. Marisha in um, when she talks about, um, you know, visionary science fiction and emancipatory science fiction, what she asks us to think about is whether the story is told by the most um, the most oppressed person, and if not, then how would the story change if that were to be the case? So in this, in all of these stories, um, all of the plot lines, we definitely see that the these characters are the most oppressed so not only do we have um like these are these are women who are uh enslaved in various different ways um two formally and then one who's Im Im impacted by she has a, a lot more jeanne has a lot more autonomy because she lives in paris and she's able she doesn't have to work um but she still has to rely upon uh, a white man um whose family hates her and is totally racist for, you know, her mother's apartment, for her mother's medication, for her own medication. And you see her vulnerability uh, as, and you see her desire to be, um, to be white, to be seen as a lady, to be treated differently. Um, you definitely see that. So they're all dealing with their own different kinds of oppression. And because it's, because this story is written from their perspectives, you can see the different layers of oppression that they have to deal with. So, for example, um, Mare, you, it's very clear that she is, um, you know, she's at, bisexual, maybe pansexual, maybe omnisexual. She's an older woman. She um, is in love with her husband um, and also in love with her lover. And she is also someone who is is you know you know soon not going to be as physically able to produce the kind of labor that's necessary on the plantation so you know she is 
experiencing oppression within oppression within oppression within oppression but she also has to deal with sexism she has to deal with um the homophobia not only from the plantation masters but also from her peers as well because her relationship with her female lover is secret um although there's a loving relationship between her lover and her husband which is really nice to see um so you know we see we see the points of view um allowing us to complicate the stories of enslaved Africans, right? Like Nalo's work is really good at that. Nalo is able to take really difficult situations and, and make them more complex and make them easier to look at from a different vantage point. Um, so yes, I would say that the points of view um, are really What word should I use? I would definitely say that the points of view that she offers really help us, help me understand power relationships better and power relationships at that time. Um, the fourth carry shell is relevance. So how does the main conflict or theme or problem assist us? Uh, the main, each of these women have a choice to make right at some point in the novel each of them has to choose whether they will break free and whether they will choose freedom uh, whether they will fight for their freedom uh, and the freedom that is offered to them is an imperfect one and they don't all say yes um, and that is a very relevant question because Sometimes in science fiction, we're offered only two options. You can stay or you can go. Um, and one option is seen as bad and another option is seen as good. But there's that binary doesn't quite exist here. And so the, um, so the, the, the conflicts do help me at least think about, like in this particular time, what is the best way to survive? What's the best way to use my skills? Um, even if I don't eradicate this particular kind of oppression, can I still make a positive impact? And the each of the characters try to figure that out. And it's, it's fun um, and deeply moving to see them try to do that. The fifth carry shell is options. What choices? Um, do the protagonists have what do they what choice what options are they presented with and i've already discussed that so i would give a full carry shell for relevance a full carry shell for options um the sixth carry shell is otherworldly elements how did the otherworldly elements expand my imagination so i will ask you to pause here and go to um ashley from bookish realms video uh, where she talks about black mermaids. Now there is a black mermaid character here. Um, but go to her video and watch it. Now I will say it's a, it's it's an hour and 17 minutes, so like get comfortable. Um, but what I really enjoyed about Ashley's video is that she talks about um, all the various different black mermaid gods that come from diasporic religions uh, from the African experience. So Yamaya, Yamoja, um, Mamiwata, Oshun, right? Um, and she's, she's trying to work through like how all of these gods are related to each other. Well, coming back to this particular book in the salt roads, we at <laughs> fail in the salt roads, we actually see a bunch of these gods in communication with each other. And there are explanations provided. So if you are interested in understanding um, the various pantheons of African Orishas, this book offers some guidance in that regard. And so the other worldly elements really um, are the realm of the gods, the various gods that communicate with each other. And there's an element of this book that actually reminds me of Freshwater. Now the those the books are very different, but what um, 
what Akweke Emeze does in fresh water at one point is they get a number of like goddess god figures in the same space and they start talking to each other and as a former christian um i really appreciate books that get the ancient gods and present gods of west african traditions in communication with the christian um the christian gods god the christian god um and figures religious figures and that happens in this book it also happens in um emese's fresh water so the other worldly elements were very pleasing to me they were at, they were kind of chaotic at first but they they you know became more um solid as the plot went on and i i appreciated that and then so full carry shell for that and then the last carry shell is the reading experience what feelings did the story give me? What was it fun to read? And I really enjoyed reading this. I the only downside to reading this book for me was that I didn't get enough of the third character, um, and I wanted to hear more from her, and I wanted to understand better how her storyline fit with the other with the other main characters. But that's a really minor critique. Um, this was a very satisfying read. I will say that there are triggers for um, triggers for uh, violence against women, financial manipulation, sexual violence, um, um, sexual oppression, enslavement of Africans, um, and religious abuse. Um, I would say that's probably a fair list. Um, Anybody who reads Nalo knows that she doesn't shy away from any of the difficult um, topics. So it's, you know, there are parts of this book that are quite difficult, um, kind of gross, kind of visceral, but, you know, it uh, it is what it is. So I would definitely recommend this to someone who is interested in reading um, fantasy and, just, there we go, somebody who is interested in reading um fantasy that that also has a strong historical fiction feel to it as well um nalo does a lot of research in this book and so we've got like i think she there's a book that she refers to called african fractals um she relies on a lot of um haitian history some uh, folklore as well so there's a lot of work here and this particular version of the book has a reading guide and the reading guide was developed by Tanana Reeve Du, and um, she is actually in conversation with Nalo Hopkinson. So at the end, there's an interview. You can't really see. There's an interview. Uh, yeah, see, T, D, and N, H. Interview between Tanana Reeve Du and Nalo Hopkinson in the back here. So yes, it was a wonderful read, beautifully written. Um, I definitely, if I do a little like, like flip this might be this might be a video fail but there was there was highlighting there I don't know why I do this you can't see it anyway that is it so uh, for day one of the readathon I mean I did start this book in July but I started it knowing that I wanted it to be one of the books that I finished for the readathon um, and it it's great that's it I hope that you enjoyed this review. If you've read The Salt Roads and, you're, and uh, you want to chat about it, please leave uh, some comments in the downstairs, as Brody would say. Um, and if you're interested in The Salt Roads, let me know. Uh, and I think that's about it. I am going to end this video with a shout out. And who will I shout out? Ah, you know what? I'm going to shout out Ashley from Bookish Realm because... She's awesome. She has a really great um, recent video on how she annotates how to read more. She's a librarian, um, so she talks. She has videos about being a librarian, uh, and of course, I would definitely commend her um, Black Mermaids project to you. She's also got some really great events coming up. So she has. She's hosting a discussion of the Deep by River Solomon on August sixth, and she is. I think she's also doing hosting another discussion with a few other booktubers um, 
in a week or so. So definitely subscribe to her channel. She's a great community builder and a wonderful person to listen to and her daughter is so adorable. So um, I will definitely shout her out. How is your readathon going? What are you reading? Thanks for watching. And of course, remember to read with purpose. If you've gotten to the end of this video, then I would like you to post a, um, let's see, let's see, let's see. What do I want? A body of water. Yeah, a body of water. Okay, bye.